Good afternoon. Um, just going to start with uh, a local update. This will, these numbers are as of this morning. Um, right now, we're at almost 3,300 cases in the five northern counties. Uh, Benoit County accounts for about 4.2%, almost 10% of the cases in Bonner County, under 2% in Boundary, and uh, almost 7% in Shoshone County. The rest of the cases are, have occurred in Kootenai County. This is actually not far from each of the counties represent a percentage of our population. Um, relatively evenly split between men and women. Um, a little more uh, on the female side, uh, but this is not consistent throughout the counties just in our overall numbers. This one might be hard for you to see. These are five-year age groups. What um, I'd like to point out is if you go down to the 20 to 25, 30 to 35-year age group, you'll see that they um, represent the largest group uh, of, in, of any of the age groups for uh, the number of cases. Uh, since school has started, we are watching um, the 5 to 19 year old age group for any increases. We have not seen anything significant yet at this point. Uh, age, or case by distribution, race distribution, um, uh, majority of the cases obviously are white followed by um, Asian, Black, Alaskan Native, Pacific Islander, um, other and unknown uh, make up more than one in five of the cases. If you're wondering why the total here has, is not consistent with our total number of cases, um, capturing race and ethnicity data uh, didn't start occurring until a little bit later pandemic after we started uh, back in March and so we haven't had a chance to go back and update those previous case records. Looking at hospitalizations, there have been 198 cases to date. That represents a 6% hospitalization rate. So when we are doing uh, forecasting, working with the hospital, that would be our, the coefficient that we're using, 6% of cases in the future would probably need hospitalization. That helps them to determine the number of beds they might need. There's also a proportion of those that would need uh, critical care and potentially ventilation. Deaths to date, uh, we have 57. That's a, a, a case fatality ratio of 1.7. That's a little under the 2% that we would see in a bad pandemic year with influenza at this point in time. Not a seasonal uh, number, a bad pandemic. This is the uh, epi curve for the cases we've received since our very first case back in uh, March. 15th of March. Uh, as you can see, we dropped down uh, fairly recently, about uh, mid-August, mid the number of cases coming in dropped down. But about the first week of September, they started climbing again. And that trend can, continues to go on at this point in time. We're seeing correlating uh, markers in other areas that I'll be showing you. This is a seven-day running average for the incidence rate. Incidence rate is a uh, 
statistic that is developed by using the populations of each of the counties as a denominator so that we can compare them directly. Otherwise, uh, 10 cases in Kootenai County would not affect this much, but 10 cases in Benoit County would infect it, would have indicated a large disease burden on that community. Uh, what we're looking at is uh, per 100,000 population. Right now, um, everybody is pretty much below uh, what we would consider to be the uh, moderate level. They're in the minimal level, which is 15 cases per 100,000 and uh, below. And each of the counties is represented by a different color. What we are seeing though in our largest counties, uh, Bonner and Kootenai, is a continuing upward trend in that rate. This is positivity, one of our other metrics that we're using. Um, this is from the Kootenai Health, primarily from the their testing site at the 2207 building. As you can see in um, July and August, we had quite a few a quite high positivity rate, up above 14%. Um, around the uh, beginning of September, it had dropped down and was actually below 4%. Um, but in the recent uh, days, it has started climbing again. What the positivity rate uh, represents is the proportion of all tests that were positive. Uh, we want to be able to, again, measure uh, apples to apples and so um, for each day, we take the total number of tests, divide into it the total number of positives, that gives us the positivity rate. We can then directly compare day over day. And what we're seeing here is an increase in the number of positive tests, and that's not reliant on the total number of tests that are done. And then the, from the state, they take all of the lab reports that we receive from laboratories that provide both positive and negative numbers of tests of performed, and they um, do the same thing. They develop a positivity rate based on that. And in the uh, last couple of weeks, um, we started to see that climb again, where uh, as of the end of last week, we were at just below 8% on the positivity rate. This is delayed a week. They, they Fellowship it once a week, and it's usually for the preceding week. Jeff, a question? Yes, sir. The testing, that's not mandatory anywhere that I'm aware of, so this is all voluntarily individuals coming in to be tested for the PCR. Uh, right. The pet PCR test. Um, yes. I, I would agree voluntarily to an extent, but they don't, they can't do it without a physician's order. So okay. this is based on a recommendation from their physician to get tested. So they've had, they have indicators that they may have the COVID. In a lot of cases. Come in, mm -hmm. is, that, is that what's prompting them? Um, or they've been recommended to get tested because they have a significant exposure to somebody with COVID-19. They may not yet be, um, symptomatic, uh, but unfortunately, what we're learning is that there is a, a fairly significant portion of the infected population that remains asymptomatic, or they may be spreading it be before they develop symptoms that we call pre-symptomatic, but comment, so. Comment, um, I know at least one person, and I suspect there are more, who in order to be able to go on a fishing trip on Kodiak Island, go fishing that's just a rule set by Alaska so as far as the PCR test itself 
how is the reliability of it as far as false positives, et cetera? Do you know what that rate is right now? Sure. The, um, when we talk about false positives and false negatives, those uh, numbers are determined by what's called the sensitivity and specificity of those tests. Um, for a false positive, what you what would usually happen is you would have a low specificity. You know, it's it's not looking specifically for the COVID-19 genome in the test. But the PCR tests are between 97 and 99 percent on their specificity. Uh, unfortunately, their sensitivity is not that high. And sensitivity is what is used to calculate the negative predicted value or the chance of having a false negative. And since the specificity is high, the sensitivity is low, what we're more worried about is having a false negative, which can occur because first off, there has to be a certain amount of DNA available for the test to um, detect it. Right, and so that doesn't occur uh, immediately. It takes a, a couple of days for it to get up to the level of the test sensitivity. And then there is a period of time where the, the sensitivity is high enough that it reduces the risk of false negatives um, by about uh, between uh, 80, 70 and 80 percent. So there's a 20 percent chance at the lowest point of getting a false negative. And that occurs around day eight after exposure. It's about 38 percent chance of false negative at day five. And day nine, it starts to go back up. So that's why we recommend a five to eight or five to nine day uh, period after somebody is exposed so that we reduce the probability of getting a false negative. And with my understanding that people become most infected by others from day four through day eight, correct? That it, in the mean, that can happen. Uh, okay. Not everybody is going to follow that pattern. That's, again, we're dealing with, with probabilities. There's always going to be outliers. Um, we, ex we consider people to be infectious about 20, 40, uh, 48 hours prior to the onset of their symptoms. Doesn't help us much when we're dealing with asymptomatic people. And there are also pre-symptomatic people who are contagious. So around that day four, they could be contagious. That's why we ask them to stay home if they've been significantly exposed. We're just asking them to delay testing until that window where we can reduce the probability of a false negative occurring. Okay. But at the same time as we see the number of cases identified through the testing, et cetera, increasing, but the mortality rate is not increasing. And in fact, it is flatlined at a pretty steady low, correct? It, uh, it has been down, and that's a good thing. I, I, I'm very happy we're not seeing deaths like we may have seen at, at the very beginning. But that's because um, the medical science, the treatment modalities have improved. You know, sure. We're eight months in to, to the, the pandemic and you know, we, well, we know that's one of the twice as much as we knew. One of the ago. factors that may have reduced it. Okay, understand. It's, there, it's a dynamic situation and there are a lot of variables um, we are improving our, our treatment modalities. Um, we're finding out what works, what doesn't work. That's a good thing. headaches, sore throat, all, all of the 
potential symptom of COVID-19. So people could be infected and not be symptomatic. And so that would make one wonder what do the mask is because they aren't causing the sneezing, but they're still infected. Well, that's why we recommend that people wear a mask whenever they're out in public, regardless of whether they have COVID-19 or not. That doesn't seem logical. Well, Any other questions? All right. Uh, do we call for a question from uh, our board members? Uh, we, we have one more presenter, Dr. Christine Hahn. She is our state epidemiologist. She's a board certified infectious disease doctor. She graduated the Epidemic Investigative Services School at the CDC. And I've had the pleasure of working with her for the last 20 years. Uh, Dr. Hahn, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great. And I don't know if Jill is going to be running the slides, but shout her uh, shout out when I um, see the slides move forward. We're going to give us a second to get that set yep. up. Yep. Uh, okay. Well, while you're getting set up, hey, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for that great presentation, and and thank you, uh, board members, for the good questions. Uh, one thing that uh, we always emphasize and uh, uh, is that this is a virus that we are learning a lot about as we go, unfortunately. Usually when we talk, if we talk about whether it's measles or it's uh, pertussis or TB, we've had years and years and years of evidence and data to study. And this is, even though we have other coronaviruses we've studied and, and people are, have information on, this is a new virus and we are very, I think, humble in our, in our knowledge and lack thereof. Um, also um, working very hard at each, I think every day I get about 10 new uh, journal articles sent to me uh, that I try to at least skim, if not read thoroughly. Um, and also, uh, as many of you are, I'm sure keeping up on um, information coming out through, uh, the, like the University of San Francisco is very good about putting out information out to John Hopkins, Harvard, CDC, World Health Organization. So. Um, one hand, we're humble in our, in our that this, there's a lot about this virus we don't know yet or that we will change, probably won't be seeing information about. But on the other hand, we're also working really hard to stay up to date, and there is tons of information coming out all the time. Um, so, anyway, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I really appreciate it. Uh, please, uh, like you did, Jeff, please stop me with questions. I don't claim to know everything about this virus, but. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I have worked in public health. I came to Idaho in 1995 as part of the CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service. Prior to that, I trained in infectious diseases at Duke University. And um, uh, so I do have a uh, background in this type of this field of study, but this is a new virus for us all. So, and my first pandemic, other than 2009, which was super, super easy compared to this. Uh, all right.
here are, has already got, we already talked about a little bit, um, many potential reasons for that. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, you can see here the hospitalization numbers nationwide, and you can see there, again, the two waves, what you expect, the second wave look a lot bigger uh, compared to what you just saw for case count. So again, um, hopefully we're learning some partly people seem to get milder infections, and we can talk about that probably Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Okay, I was gone. Um, yeah, we were just talking about the 
those that you're out front and just a reminder I think I don't know if this I think this got cut off right I was making this point these data are sobering also they're from that first wave and as we'll talk about in a little bit um, uh, things are changing with this virus but this is what uh, was just published uh, from, from patients from the first wave um, okay uh, let's go to the next slide so here this is one of the slides I wanted to talk about um, when we talk about the severity it is really really hard to get your head around it um, we've had all sorts of questions about how death certificates are completed and are some people dying with COVID instead of of COVID and all sorts of things and I just wanted to this data to me this is from the CDC website um, from the National Vital Statistics System and it is to me the clearest illustration I can think of to talk about the excess deaths that have been seen in this country. So what this is, is this is all deaths reported. This doesn't, so if you are concerned that physicians or coroners are reporting deaths that are really due to something else and they're actually calling them COVID deaths, this will take, this should eliminate that concern because these are all deaths reported. The green bars represent, um, so those are all historical through the 2017, and you can see that little peak there in around January of 2018 on the left side of your slide. And that is the peak that, um, that was a bad, what we call a bad flu season. So you can see those pluses mean those are weeks in which the case, the deaths were higher than expected based on that orange line being sort of the number, the usual number of deaths that we see every year in this country and a little bit of a wave-like pattern as deaths increase in the winter months. So that was a bad flu year. We were talking earlier, I think, about it. What's a bad flu year? That was a bad flu year, 2017, 2018, and some of you may remember that. Whereas 2019, 2018-19 uh, really didn't look so bad. Uh, and then coming up to the far right of your screen here, you can see uh, the blue um, bars are deaths that were attributed to COVID-19. Um, and those are real deaths. Those are deaths that have been reported. So this country has seen an increase in deaths overall. So whether you or not you believe um, they were due to COVID-19 at all, you have to, I think, agree that there has been a sudden increase that's continued uh, in overall deaths in this country. Uh, next so the other thing I want to mention about severity is that there's some data now, we don't have a lot of good data about long-term impacts because it hasn't been around that long, right? But there have been a couple a couple things to point out. This is a World Health Organization slide, so just a couple points that they made about based on worldwide data. We have a lot of data from other countries we like to look at. China, for example, Europe has ways for more the United States. But nausea, most people have mild symptoms, don't even know they get infected or have moderate disease, uh, about 5% become critically ill. And most people, and you can see this little graphic little chart below, with mild disease are pretty much feeling okay by two weeks after onset. In fact, that's one reason why people with illness that starts with a symptom onset, uh, people are allowed to go back to work and all that at about 10 days uh, because of the fact that you can't culture the virus out of people after nine days and, uh, and the almost always completely recovered. Obviously, we want to see both. We want to see that good 10 days uh, from onset. We want to see people with no symptoms, and they're allowed to go back to work. However, some people we know with severe disease, especially, can really go on for a longer course of illness. Um, however, more concerning than that, uh, most of us would probably be able to put up with six weeks of coughing and fatigue, but unfortunately, some people appear to have even a longer course. Next slide. So here's, a, here's, for example, I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a medium term survey done by CDC um, about uh, people who tend to have longer uh, courses of illness. And this was a survey done by people about two to three weeks after they had tested positive. Uh, next slide. So you can see here that a fairly high number of people, sorry, yeah, I hope it's not caught up at the bottom for you guys, it is a little bit for me, but about, uh, about 50% of patients on average you can see there that uh, had some lingering symptom at the time of interview. So two to three weeks out, they still had a cough or fatigue, headache, a diarrhea, et cetera. Again, this is uh, for most people not too worrisome as long as it's eventually resolved. Uh, next uh, slide, please. 
However, what's becoming more clear, and this is from the journal Nature, is a recent news story just talking about this concept of long haulers or long-term symptoms. And this is a quote from the story just trying to explain why some people think that's long-term effect. And just a reminder, when you study a respiratory virus, you think, okay, there's some coughing, there's some lung problems, maybe a pneumonia. But this virus is showing that it is much more than a respiratory disease, especially when people get severe illness. It actually attacks other cells in the body. The ACE2 receptor that is in that, that the virus has is actually found on multiple cells of the body, not just lung cells. And it also appears to cause some immunosuppressive, as other viruses have been known to do. So it appears that there are some growing case reports of people who have long, uh, long recoveries from this and maybe ultimately will decide to have long-term health problems from it. Next slide. Just wanted to throw this up there since I was uh, looking for some stories about Eastern Idaho and I just stumbled across this. So uh, this talks about a woman who has gone public and said that she is still struggling with long-term fatigue and other health problems after having recovered from COVID-19. Uh, next story. Next slide. Uh, so, okay, I just want to focus a little bit on the Idaho data now. I hope most of you go to our website, it's coronavirus.idaho.gov, and it has just been revamped to be a little quicker and easier to sort through and look through all our data. This is our current epi curve, and I just wanted to point out, right now I'm just showing you confirmed cases, so this is not even um, looking at the probable cases that are identified. These are all PCR confirmed cases. And you can see the red arrow there, I'm trying to point out that tail going up. So we're starting to see that rise, similar to what Jeff showed you in your health district as well. So statewide, we are starting to see case counts go up again. Next slide. These are hospitalization data, again, off of our website. These are the hospital data that they report directly into the federal system um, through uh, Teletracker. And you might have heard this morning there was big news because um, the federal government is going to really crack down on hospitals that are not reporting and potentially cut their Medicare uh, payments. Uh, so very important. We're getting very good reporting right now in Idaho. Actually, most hospitals are doing a great job of reporting every single day. So very timely, reported directly by the hospital. And the one above, I want to point out, this is the number of people in the hospital. Um, so this is just your patient census with COVID. We have been seeing some nice declines since early August. We were feeling pretty good, but really in the last few weeks, you can see that has that has flattened out. We are no longer seeing a drop in people that are in the hospital. We're seeing that sort of start to flatten. And in a number of people in the intensive care, which is hovered around 50-ish, uh, I'm hopeful that those last few days are a real positive sign, but as uh, that we are starting to see a drop in intensive care cases, but I'm not. I'm worried with our case numbers going up, with our hospitalization numbers starting to flatten or uh, not continue to decrease, that our intensive care cases will go up as well again. At the bottom, um, you'll see by age group, as we talked about, this is total, this is not adjusted for age group, so you can see, even though we know that the older you are, the more severe the disease is, we just have more people in these younger age groups, so the, the, the largest representative group there are people in the 60s and 70s. Okay, next slide. And then among deaths, um, as, we, as we talked about a couple times, uh, people um, 80 and older are by far the highest risk of death. Um, and in Idaho, as of the nation, we see more men dying of this than women. And we also are happy to see that we don't seem to have a large race uh, or, I didn't show this in this slide, uh, but or ethnicity disparity in deaths. Our Hispanic, uh, we have cases that are more frequent in Hispanic uh, population compared to the uh, non-Hispanic, but not among deaths. Uh, that is uh, actually proportion, fairly proportional as is other as among other races. Uh, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to quick show you, this is my map. It's unofficial. I use this, I update this for myself to try to keep a track on what counties that I worried about. Um, I just wanted to highlight, you see a few epi curves I have in there to show you the type of things we're seeing. 
green kind of leaves our counties in which right now I'm saying, okay, looks pretty good. You know, fewer than 10 per 10 cases per 100,000 over the last couple weeks. So I feel like they're looking pretty good. Um, yellow counties are ones that are a little higher than that, but in my estimation are fairly stable that we don't see a big increase going on right now. Uh, Ada and Canyon County, you'll see I'm calling them yellow right now. We're not seeing, in fact, uh, as you can see that epi curve from Ada County, we continue to see decreases in Ada County. Um, we'll talk later about this. I think this is partly due to the mass order in place uh, in Ada County and in Boise City. Um, it, it just has really nice declines here. Um, other parts of the state that are really struggling right now are through the southeastern part of the state. Um, you can see this by, I believe, McDonald County out there, one of our counties that's really struggling right now, very high rates. Um, they have put various uh, orders into place, and it's really where I, I think uh, we've seen the most success so far, Teton County, where not only did the county put an order into place, but two cities uh, put orders into place. Uh, they actually were able to turn around their, their rates of infection, and they're, they're looking really good right now. Idaho County, I wanted to show you guys that to really make the point that that big spike there is uh, the uh, Cottonwood Correctional Facility has a large outbreak with over 100 cases. And so the county itself, uh, those cases get attributed to the county, if you will, but really in the general population, uh, the rates are really quite low. Um, and this is mostly um, confined to this uh, inmate population. But again, they have staff that go in and out of that, uh, of that facility that could spread it to the community. So we're very worried about that. Fayette County and um, previously Washington County, although Washington County seems to be turning around, uh, Payette County continues to see high rates. Um, and, and that's pretty interesting because now their county, Oregon, also has very high rates. Uh, so that's how things are looking this week in, in Idaho as far as kind of where I'm seeing some of the, the trouble spots, if you will. Uh, next slide. I, this is my, I put unofficial at the bottom of this. Uh, you can see the footnote, it's cut off on my screen, but I hope you can see that. I track the uh, orders that are currently in place that I'm aware of around the state. And you can see here, um, the blue counties or cities are areas that have put in some type of mass order, social distancing order, something has been placed. The counties in green are orders, are, are counties where there's been a resolution or recommendation by a health board, um, but not a not an order. So um, you can see there are already mentioned that in southeastern Idaho, some of the counties have uh, orders in place. Um, Victor and Briggs still do, but Teton County does not. They lifted their order because of a turnaround in their in their case numbers. Okay, next slide. Just this is to remind me to mention. I hope you all know this is up there on the State Department of Education website, a nice way to track different school districts. You can zoom in and get um, close-ups of all the different school districts and which ones are open for in-person, hybrid, online, closed, or are completely closed, which no school, school systems are right now in Idaho. And on the right-hand side, the charter schools, the same information. My kids, for example, are online only right now. Uh, they're in the Boise School District, uh, but uh, they just started opening up this week for the youngest kids and we are starting to bring some kids back. Uh, next slide. So a couple thoughts about masks and face coverings, which I know is one of the things you guys will be talking about. Um, like the, the million dollar question, of course, is do they work and what evidence is there that they work? Um, first of all, there is some laboratory evidence that is not perfect, but um, I'm going to leave aside the vast amount of evidence that is out there for surgical, in general, in healthcare settings, there have been many, many studies, and I think, I think that's not controversial for anybody. Nobody wants to have surgery and have the surgeon decide not to wear a mask. That is well accepted in, um, throughout years and years of the lots of conditions and diseases that have been shown to be blocked by proper use of PPE in a healthcare setting, so I'm not going to really even address that. Um, but just a couple things that recently that have come out about uh, COVID in particular or cloth face coverings, because this is kind of a, a brave new world for us. One is that uh, the study in the upper right hand corner is from uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, just showing that uh, looking at a way to kind of 
crack droplets and then showing that even that what they use was a slight, what they call a slightly damp washcloth. I'm not quite sure why they decided to use that type of cloth covering uh, because none of us are dampening our, our face coverings, but they just showed that that should have good protection and, and reduced the amount of droplets. Um, the second uh, study they're mentioning because it did include coronaviruses, seasonal coronaviruses, and it just showed that um, they had people that were known to be infected, I thought it was a, a really interesting study, known to be infected with flu or a seasonal coronavirus, and then they had a, a surgical mask on and they showed that you couldn't detect viruses through the mask. They tried to actually uh, culture the, uh, those people were speaking and so that the mask blocked the virus from leaving, the, leaving their uh, face area with the mask on. And then I love the hamster study. They've done some really nice hamster stuff. Study that, <coughs> excuse me, you guys may have seen, uh, showing that it was a model in a laboratory setting of hamsters and using these sort of partitions that were meant to, uh, that were made out of surgical mask material, and they showed that if you put infected hamsters next to non infected hamsters, having that material between them, not only did it prevent many of them from getting infected, it actually, uh, the ones that got infected got a, a milder seasonal illness. And this will go. This will go into a little bit of. Uh, well, let, let me talk about that on the next slide. Something about the additional benefit of masks. So let's just go to the next slide, and then I can mention it there. So what's the what's the real world evidence out there? It is weak uh, compared to what we'd like to see. None of all of us would love to see a study where they took some people who masked them and took others who didn't mask them and see who gets sick. Uh, but that's considered unethical right now because uh, the evidence is strong enough that masks will help. Uh, that it's considered unethical to do that gold, you know, gold standard study. What we do know is that a couple, couple things. One is that when we looked at when uh, researchers have been interested, have looked at states that have put mask mandates into in effect, uh, there appears there is a temporal decline in cases uh, that. And that in the study that is shown there on the right, they compared it to states that did not do such orders and showed it didn't show benefit for the mask order. The other types of studies that I find that are really intriguing are these two studies that have been published that I'm aware of. One of the airplane, um, uh, a person who wore a mask while ill on an airplane. Yeah, they uh, did a really good job of trying to track back everybody that had been on that plane not able to show transmission. Doesn't prove anything, but it's it's helpful to know that. The hair salon is even more interesting in a way, and this was in Missouri. Uh, two salon workers, and they only wore the cloth face coverings. They did not have surgical masks. And boy, you talk about being in your face. Um, you go to the hair salon, you got somebody breathing on you right next to you for an extended period of time. Um, Missouri did an extended uh, uh, contact investigation of these ill salon workers, and nobody uh, got infected because at that hair salon, uh, the, the customers and the uh, workers were required to wear face coverings. And I'll just mention, since I don't have a slide on this, but I just want to mention that um, there's also a growing theory, and this is supported by uh, experts, and it's just an editorial in Monroe Medicine uh, from the University of California, San Francisco, that even if masks would not getting infected completely, um, if you get a lower inoculum, if you're exposed to less virus, that you probably would get a milder illness. Um, and that concept has been shown to be true with other infectious diseases. And uh, so there's a theory that maybe that's one reason why we're seeing a lower mortality rate if people are masking or social distancing and are getting potentially getting less of an exposure or less of an inoculum. Uh, maybe we're having more people get milder illness for that reason. So it's just a hypothesis. Um, we already talked about younger people getting uh, getting infected. Masks might mean uh, milder cases out there. Masking might mean milder cases because we're seeing uh, lower of the inoculum when people do get exposed. There might be a little bit of herd immunity developing. We don't think there's a lot of that out there yet. In Idaho, blood donor data is saying maybe two to three percent of people have antibodies at least among blood donors. Um, and then lastly, of course, we have better treatments. Uh, so people that end up in the hospital um, are probably, uh, and we don't have this data yet for Idaho, but uh, probably uh, getting better 
better treatment, they're getting remdesivir, they're getting oxygen, they're getting treatments that are in steroids uh, that are preventing this. Uh, I think that's all, I, I can't remember, and I apologize, did you, um, did you go to the next slide? I can't remember, I think it's my last slide. Okay, so yeah, in conclusion, I wanted to mention a couple things. Uh, first of all, we are worried. Um, things looked pretty good even two weeks ago, but we're starting to see cases go up. We're worried flu season's coming, and we're very worried about hospital capacity. That right hand um, story there in my slide, it just was, came out yesterday um, from southeastern Idaho. Uh, chief medical officers of two hospitals had said that they are close to being overwhelmed by patients infected with the coronavirus. So we are seeing healthcare facilities in Idaho now, and this is flu season hasn't even really started yet, that are saying that they are uh, potentially over, going to be overwhelmed. That is something we all want to avoid, and we need to do everything we can to prevent it. Kids are going back to school, um, universities and colleges are opening. We have had cases, clusters, and outdoor breaks linked to that. We are hoping by next Friday to have um, information about that posted on our webpage. We're just working through how that would, how that would look like. Uh, we need to make sure the schools understand what we're going to be posting. Uh, but we are seeing clusters and outbreaks, especially associated with um, sports teams, um, associated with uh, cheerleading, things like that. Um, schools have, um, are doing what they can, uh, but we are worried about spread in school. Fall weather, we're all going back inside. I'm a big believer in UV light, and uh, it makes it easier to social distance, it makes it easier to go off and see, go out for a run instead of um, hanging out indoors, uh, but it's getting colder and darker. And then third, lastly, because it's COVID fatigue, uh, you know, we're all getting tired of, of social distancing, staying at home, wearing our masks, and I just worry that people are losing their, gonna lose their vigilance. So we're very concerned about what's in store for us for the fall. And my recommendation is to wrap up is to maximize the use for you all to, uh, to make recommendations, make guidance, make orders, that's what is needed to uh, maximize the use of cloth face coverage, masks to help reduce the transmission, illness, and to protect your hospital capacity. Um, so I think that's it, and um, I stand for any questions, or I'm happy to stay while you guys have the conversation as well. Um, I think that's my very last question. mistaken, um, Dr. Hahn uh, and Jeff, a positive case isn't like the old days where you actually had to be sick to be a case. Now a positive case is a positive test. And I would maintain that the test itself uh, uh, doesn't seem to discriminate between symptomatic people and asymptomatic which is why the makers of the test say that no test should be considered positive without corroborating symptoms. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually better if you don't touch the mic. Okay. Dr. Hahn, did you hear the, the question? Yeah. Yeah. the question to you and I'll put you on speakerphone. Um, the question is, um, in, in the case of COVID-19, the, um, the criteria for a positive case is a positive test without evidence of, of illness. Um, and that, according to the person asking the question, is not. Jeff, we're back up. 
Okay. We back up, Jeff? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now hang up. <laughs> I did. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, I, I hear the question. I'm happy to, to answer. First, I'm sorry, I don't know who asked the question, so I can just. Dr. Banks. Alan Banks. Dr. Banks. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, a couple points about that. You know, when we do case definitions in epidemiology, we are not just making diagnoses like clinical. We're not the we're not acting as clinicians who are trying to diagnose an illness. We're trying to track a disease. And so I want you to know that we 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 totally understand the limits. I mean, we haven't even gotten started with the limitations of our testing situation. We have more and more antigen tests being done. We haven't really talked about that today, but those tests have even lower sensitivities. They even have some specificity problems we didn't anticipate. So that's one reason when I look at the severity of this epidemic and think about how we need to respond, case numbers are, they're helpful, but they're not what I care about. Um, what I care about is the number of people that end up in the hospital with this disease, the number of people that end up dying of this disease, the number of people that end up with severe complications. I didn't mention, but we've now had three children who've been hospitalized, and fortunately all have recovered and gone home, but that were hospitalized with that multi-system inflammatory condition, you know, of children. Um, those, that's what we care about. So I agree with you, you know, you could, we, we uh, have some of those cases that are counted and are asymptomatic. Um, I'm not worried about that person and their health. They will probably do just fine, but it's really the impact on the community, their ability to transmit it. The asymptomatic people, as we talked about, there's some evidence that they might be worse transmitters because they're out, but they aren't wearing a mask. Like Jeff made that point earlier, I'm not sure why there was confusion about it. I wear a mask every time I go outside. Why? Not because I'm sick, but because I'm not sick. So I don't want to accidentally uh, spread to somebody if I'm infected and don't know it. So that, that's why people need to wear masks even if they feel well. We know that they can be even worse uh, transmitters. They're going to go to the bars, they're going to go to the restaurants, etc. Yes, Dr. McLeodry. Uh, Dr. Kahn, I have a question uh, regarding the recent studies and the validity of those studies that 35 to 40 percent of people are asymptomatic um, and your comment on that the validity of that and then the impact again on the uh, communicability in the community yeah thank you Dr. McClendon yeah so you know the, the percent of people that are asymptomatic is we will never know that for sure until um, studies get done that literally go through and screen large numbers of people like randomly, right, in like a research way. Uh, because as I think, uh, I don't know if Dr. Banks, somebody asked this question earlier, the people getting tested in Idaho right now, we know that most of them go in for symptoms. Um, so we're not really getting a good feel for the asymptomatic number of people who are asymptomatic infected. In Idaho right now, only about 10% of our cases that test positive, only about 10% of those are asymptomatic. So most of our testing is people that are showing up and saying, I have a cough, I have a fever, we need to figure out what this is. So your 40% uh, is the number being, um, because of the currently available data that's being quoted right now, but I'll tell you, we're seeing a lot higher percent asymptomatic in some of our populations, like the prisons, the jails, um, they're having almost universal asymptomatic infections in that population, except you'll have a few people who get very, very sick and, and they've even had someone die at the state facility down here, uh, one of the prisoners who, inmates who uh, died. So uh, that number is going to probably vary by population. In, in the cruise ship, um, they had a high rate of asymptomatic, and they thought that was because they masked up. Um, they, they, in the cruise ship outbreak, the Diamond Princess, um, they actually had almost about 80% asymptomatic, and they believe part of that might have been they instructed all the were inmates, the, uh, the cruisers uh, wore masks. So, so the rate of asymptomatic um, infection is probably directly related to age, directly related to whether uh, people are exposed to large amounts of virus. Okay, uh, Glenn Bailey has a question. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hahn, I appreciate your presentation and your recommendations. My question for you is uh, in our in Cottonwood, for example, are the yes. inmates there being required to wear a face mask? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Glenn. I, uh, I, my understanding, yes. I, I am on a call weekly 
do with the Department of Corrections, kind of work with them on how they're doing. I know that in the facility here in the Boise and the Kuna area, they did require them all to wear face coverings. I believe that's the case with Cottonwood. I am just kind of catching up to that outbreak a little bit, um, but I believe that is also the case there. I'm not positive though. Okay, but I would observe that despite wearing the face masks, some people were still getting COVID and it's a younger population for the most part that are recovering from COVID. And again, COVID is a threat to the population 75 and older, correct? Uh, I think it's because they are certainly at higher risk. spikes and goes up and down, trends, um, that the number of deaths, the mortality rate, is not commensurate with that at this point from the last few weeks. Is that correct? Well, I, you know, I did not uh, include this slide, and I can't, uh, I don't believe I can share my screen with you all. But if you look at the deaths, I didn't show the deaths in Idaho over time. We did have quite a few, quite a large number of deaths this fall. I, I hope you don't, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that deaths are not happening. Uh, we had a small number of deaths in the spring wave. If you look at that at the percent of cases, the percent of cases, it is lower than it was in spring, absolutely. But we did have a large number of deaths this fall. We continue to, I look at death certificates, I look at every death certificate. I think it's important for me to understand who's dying. And I saw two today already. We are having deaths. It's just not the same proportion of, uh, that we were seeing this last spring. Correct. And, yep. so, and that's being noted statewide, nationwide, and throughout the world, you see that the numbers may be increasing as we enter the fall and we're getting in closer and we've got schools reconvening but you don't see a commensurate rise in the death rate. Yes, it's sad that we do have deaths, but as I understand it from the Center of Disease Control, that the people who have died from COVID-19 without other comorbid issues is only 6% of those being noted on their death certificate as having COVID present when they died. So that's- Wait, I, I, that didn't quite, I did not follow you on that, I'm sorry. Okay, just, the total death number again. in the United States is a little over 200,000. Of those deaths, CDC has said that only 6% of that 200,000 died solely of COVID-19. The oh, others I think what all okay, had- the others all had comorbidity issues. They had diabetes, they were overweight, they had lung disease, they had heart disease. In other words, those were the major contributing factors. Those who died solely of COVID-19 um, yeah, were 6%. Yeah, let me just that. Um, and I, now I know what data you're talking about. Again, I look at death certificates every day are people that if it weren't for COVID would probably still be alive. Yes, they were obese, but they didn't die of their obesity. Yes, they had diabetes, but they didn't die from the diabetes. The diabetes contributed because 
we know people with diabetes or obesity or other things, they are more susceptible to severe illness and death. Uh, but if, if I'm overweight or obese and I get COVID uh, and die, that is not correct to say I just died from obesity. And I think that's what you're trying to turn this into. That is not what CDC is saying. They're saying that most people that die do have one of these underlying conditions, absolutely. But I don't think that should <laughs> reassure us. Uh, many Idahoans are obese. Many Idahoans have diabetes. Many I Idahoans have underlying health conditions or have had a kidney transplant or one of these other conditions. Okay, thank you. And at this point, uh, they're working hard on vaccines. Do you have any further information on when that vaccine, I understand there's three primary vaccines when one will be available to our highly at risk older population, our medical staff, et cetera? Yeah, so I do. In fact, I'm on the advisory committee for immunization practices as a liaison member of the state from the state epidemiologist. So I, I am on all those calls. We, you may have heard we just had a meeting. Um, they have not yet formally voted uh, but everybody believes healthcare workers will probably be the first group recommended to receive the vaccine. Um, and there is hope that that will be as soon as November um, when there are not gonna, there's not gonna be a lot of vaccine available in November probably, but, uh, and we don't know which one yet. Uh, you mentioned the three that are currently in clinical trials um, and we don't actually have that data yet. And there's been no vaccine as you know, authorized or licensed in the United States yet. So bringing the broader population, like people with diabetes, let's say, that is probably going to be months down the road after that. I think we'll be lucky if we have something for healthcare workers uh, before the end of the year, and, and highly unlikely, I think, that we'll have a large amount of vaccine available this year, but nobody can say for sure. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hong, indeed, for taking the time to spend it with us here this afternoon, and also thank you, Jeff, for your uh, presentation, and do you have any closing comments? I don't, but thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. We will.